um, and we're on the record now. Uh, so, so yeah, just as a procedural matter, uh, during the talk, uh, you know, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat, and then we, we'll ask them at the end. Um, or if you prefer, you can just hold back till the end, and then you can use reactions to raise your hand, and I'll call on you to answer your question, just reminding you, because it's been a little while since we've done this uh, Zoom thing. Um, and now it's sort of my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Samantha Lawler. She was educated at Caltech, Wesleyan, and UBC, uh, where she did her PhD. Uh, she was an NRC Hertzberg postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Victoria. She's also a Plaskett fellow before taking up her present position um, at Campion College and the University of Regina in sunny Saskatchewan. It is a sunny place, right? as things go yes. just cold <laughs> but sunny yeah yeah <laughs> right right yeah uh she, she's been a member of several major collaborations and surveys including the outer solar system origin survey and classy of which she's the co-pi um, her past work has included studies of exoplanet systems and she's contributed to the debate about the existence of planet nine uh making the argument that the evidence for it is extremely weak as she may tell us today um, Sam is an active science writer for the general public, um, writing for both adults and children on topics such as exoplanets and whether Pluto is a planet. Uh, she's also been engaged in advocating for safety and regulation of proposed mega constellations of satellites and actually not proposed, they're actually up there now, uh, which she may tell us more about today. Um, and finally, she has an, uh, there's an unusual distinction. She has a minor planet named after her. And so with that, welcome, uh, Sam, the floor is yours. Cool. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for um, uh, setting this up so that I could give the talk remotely. That works much better for me. So, um, so I'm going to be basically giving two separate talks that are linked uh, because one of the talks is going to make the other talk harder to happen in the future. So I want to talk about, I'm going to start off with, with fun, happy science, and then I'm going to have more of a depressing ending. I'm sorry. Uh, not the fun way to do this, but um, so I'm going to start off talking about um, the Kuiper Belt. So uh, so I want to uh, also just start by acknowledging that I live here. I'm giving this talk from uh, Canadian Treaty 4 territory. Uh, this is the land of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Métis Mishif, all of who have uh, very strong uh, cultures and active practice of, of stargazing. Um, and uh, the data that I'm going to talk about today come from Mauna Kea, which is sacred to indigenous Hawaiians. And uh, there's a lot of uh, really awful colonial history wrapped up in those telescopes that I still use. I'm still coming to terms with that. Um, so, uh, so Pluto uh, was the original trans-Neptunian object, right? So, uh, so Kuiper belt object, trans-Neptunian object, same, same idea, just different terms for the same thing. I'll use those interchangeably. So, um, so Pluto, one of the reasons it was a planet was because it was discovered decades before the second TNO was discovered. Um, and we've gotten better and better views of Pluto over the years, um, including the amazing views from the New Horizons telescope or the New Horizons mission, well, I guess a camera on a spacecraft flying past Pluto. Just absolutely stunning pictures of how beautiful this tiny world is, right? Uh, like, I love this is one of my favorite pictures ever taken in in astrophysics, right? It's, you know, it looks like a computer generated image looking along the edge of Pluto. You can see mountains made out of water ice uh, surround floating on top of glaciers made out of nitrogen ice. There's layers of the atmosphere. It's just incredible, right? Pluto is a world with geology, right? But it's not a planet, right? So, so the reason that it's it there's a couple of reasons why it's it's not a planet. It's a Kuiper Belt object. Um, it's not. It doesn't orbit <laughs> the same way. All right, all of our planets are within within a few degrees of of um the the plane of the solar system. Pluto's tilted by 17 degrees, right? Um, there's also lots of other Kuiper Belt objects of almost the same size. Uh, as Pluto that are on very similar orbits. So it has not cleared its orbit of similarly sized bodies, which is, you know, the IAU definition of a planet. Um, so, uh, 
So just some basics. So some of you already know this, but uh, just to, to review, because we're going to talk about orbits a bunch. Um, so eccentricity tells you how uh, elliptical an orbit is, right? How squished it is. A circle has an eccentricity of zero. Um, a parabola has an eccentricity of one. Pluto has an eccentricity of 0.24, right? And, and paracenter is the closest position in the orbit to the sun. Um, when you're talking about solar system orbits. Uh, and then inclination is just how tilted it is relative to the plane of the solar system, right? So Pluto's tilted by 17 degrees. Um, and then semi-major axis, just how big is the orbit, right? One AU, the distance from the Earth to the sun, right? Um, so Earth, uh, Earth's at one AU, Neptune's at 30 AU. Um, the main Kuiper belt is at like 40 to 42 AU. So this is a uh, leftover, uh, leftover planetesimals that are in fairly circular, dynamically cold orbits. Um, Sedna, one of the most distant known Kuiper Belt objects, um, at at its closest to the sun, its paracenter is at 76 AU, right? But at its farthest, its apocenter goes out to almost a thousand AU from the sun, right? Um, so just, you know, give you a little more scale of how far that is, right? Voyager has been flying away from the sun at many hundreds of or tens of thousands of kilometers per hour for 46 years, and it's only at 162 AU, right? So it's, uh, that's really far. <laughs> These are very big distances. And then, of course, there's the Oort cloud, which is even further out, um, 10,000 to 100,000 AU, right? So Sedna is really just in the the inner edge of the Oort cloud. It's sometimes called an inner Oort cloud object. Um, okay, so back to the main Kuiper belt. Um, so Pluto has this very special kind of orbit um, that I could give an entire other talk about because I love these orbits. So Pluto actually crosses Neptune's orbit. It's in what's called a mean motion resonance. So um, it has, uh, whenever it crosses Neptune's orbit, um, so this is the heliocentric frame, right? Looking down on the solar system, blue is Neptune, purple is Pluto. Over here, we have the co-rotating frame. So if you imagine looking down on the heliocentric frame and kind of rotating at the same speed Neptune's orbiting to hold uh, Neptune fixed, this is what Pluto does relative to Neptune. So because of this mean motion resonance, um, Pl whenever Pluto crosses Neptune's orbit, it's as far away as possible, right? It's basically 90 degrees away um, because it goes around the sun exactly twice in the same amount of time that Pluto goes around the sun exactly three times, right? So, um, so it turns out that there are a lot of TNOs in different mean motion resonances. And the best explanation for how this happened is that the giant planets moved. So this is um, a simulation of the Nice model. This is one possible way that the giant planets could have moved. Uh, the four giant planets are shown here much closer to the sun. They're in a metastable state where they stay for a few hundred thousand or hundred million years. Um, and then suddenly Jupiter and Saturn scatter each other and that causes the whole thing to just explode outward and destroy the initial Kuiper belt. And then as Neptune circularizes back to a, a more reasonable orbit, it sort of captures a whole bunch of Kuiper belt objects into its mean motion resonances. So that's, that's the story that we have right now to explain why so many Kuiper belt objects are in these mean motion resonances. Um, let's see if my, oh dear, my computer's frozen. Hang on a second. It did not like the animation, too many animations. <laughs> hmm. Oh dear. I'm sorry. I'll have to hang hang on a second. Yeah. See if I can get this back. Poor computer. Okay. I'll get it in just a moment. Sorry about that. I had not only destroyed right. the solar system, I had destroyed my poor sad computer. <laughs> oh. Okay, reopening. Trying to reopen. Okay, there we go. And back to where we left off. So the Nice model uh, kind of explains the um, what we see in in the solar system. There we go. 
Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so we have, um, whoops, did I accidentally stop sharing? Sorry. Ah. Okay. So this is showing our, our solar system, um, the, the outer solar system. So this is, um, uh, eccentricity versus semi-major axis, right? Um, so, so Neptune is like here. Uh, so this is what we know of the the Kuiper belt. Um, uh, and so, so this is this is the structure that we see. So these these uh, lines here, right? You see these these higher eccentricities. So those cross Neptune's orbit, but they are protect protected from um, from uh, ever interacting directly with Neptune because uh they they are in these special orbits right so um so we have models that sort of produce this right we have these computer models like i just showed those produce a distribution of kuiper belt objects um but we're not going to be able to see all of them right uh as you get farther and farther away from the sun it gets harder and harder to see them um so uh so so um you know, this is really extreme for Kuiper belt objects because we see them in reflected light, right? So, um, so, uh, so light from the sun has to go all the way out to the Kuiper belt object, right? Drops by one over distance squared, and then it has to reflect off the Kuiper belt object and come basically all the way back to the sun because we're so far away from the Kuiper belt objects, right? So another one over distance squared. So, uh, so that means that when a Kuiper Belt object is 10 times farther away, it's 10,000 times fainter, right? So we are very much biased toward finding um, these Kuiper Belt objects at their closest point in their orbit, right? And um, and because of Kepler's second law, they spend most of their time at their more distant, fainter orbits, right? So, uh, so it's hard to find these really distant objects. Um, so this brings us to the planet nine theory. So probably many of you have seen this. This plot is all over the place. Um, so so this is the theory of planet nine. So there are there was a handful of very distant Kuiper belt objects. So these are sometimes called high paracenter Kuiper belt objects because they never get very close to the sun. Right, they're always very far away. And all six of the first ones that were discovered were on one side of the solar system. That's pretty weird, right? Um, so one way you can explain that is if there is a massive undiscovered planet, so something like 10 times uh, the mass of the Earth orbiting at about 500 AU, right? So much, much farther out than Neptune. Um, you can use uh, some very complicated orbital dynamics to kind of constrain these very distant objects to be pointed all in the same direction. So, um, but the question that I was immediately worried about is, okay, so uh, so you can see that these are all discovered very close to their paracenters, right? You can see in this little plot. Um, so, uh, so did anybody look over here like right <laughs> like we see that they're all kind of in the same direction so um so that's one thing that's really important with these biases where you look and don't find anything is just as important as where you look and do find stuff and that's not something that you know astronomers really like to report because oh yeah we we pointed our telescope over here and we didn't find anything like you can't write a paper about that so how do how do you deal with that how do you how do you deal with these biases and um, so this was kind of one of the main goals of the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, a very careful, I would argue, Canadian uh, way to, to find TNO. So, um, so this was uh, an international team of, of about 40 astronomers uh, across eight countries. Um, we used uh, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Um, we used the Megacam instrument, which is a huge wide field camera. Uh, right. It's it's um, it's something like a square degree on the sky. It's fantastic. Uh, and we find Kuiper Belt objects the same way that Pluto was found. Right. Look at a spot on the sky, take a picture, uh, take another picture an hour later, another picture an hour later and see what moves. Right. And so fortunately, we have computer programs to uh, do a lot of the the um, finding the moving objects for us. Uh, we don't have to look at all of the images, but it's it's the same same way that Pluto was discovered. So, um, so we put many many pointings of uh, CFHT on the sky, right? And so we have these sort of blocks 
on the sky. Um, so this is this is the plane of the solar system cutting through the uh, uh, right ascension declination plot. Um, and in each of these blocks, we know uh, how much area we covered. We know what brightness limit we had. We know how many objects were tracked. Um, and so we can use that information, right? Um, so, uh, so this is everything that we discovered in the sur survey. So, uh, so almost 900, so 840 uh, new TNOs were discovered. Uh, and at the time of the survey, only 2,000 TNOs were known, and only about a thousand of those had good enough orbits uh, that you could recover them. Most of them have been lost. So, uh, so this is our, our slices through the solar system where we looked. Um, the blue dots are what we discovered. Um, and uh, so we can then take those discoveries and de-bias them, right? So here's our you know, eccentricity, inclination versus semi-major axis. So this is um, a subset of what we actually discovered. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can see like, okay, so something like that, like way out there, that's really hard to find, right? If you find one thing way out there on that kind of orbit, that means there's a whole bunch of other things on very similar orbits that you did not find. So, um, so we can statistically, uh, you know, apply our, our biases. We can say, okay, well, if the distribution looked like this, what's the likelihood that we would find one thing out there, right? So with that, uh, we can very carefully go through each subpopulation and say, okay, so if we looked over here, if the survey, if the population looks like this and we look over here, does that match what we actually saw, right? So it's, it's a very careful process to recover the actual populations and orbital distributions, right? So, so this is what the Kuiper belt looks like, right? All of these little teeny tiny dots um, that is a real Kuiper Belt object that's out there. So we know that there's about 400,000 Kuiper Belt objects bigger than 100 kilometers. And, you know, we only know about 3,000 of them right now. So we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, so going back to the high paracenter TNO, so these are the hardest ones to find, right? Um, uh, so this is paracenter distance, so the closest point in their orbit to the sun, versus semi-major axis orbit size. Um, so this is from the minor, minor Planet Center database. So this is just all of the discoveries. You don't know what surveys, that, well, you can look up what surveys they're from, but you don't necessarily know the biases of the surveys because a lot of surveys don't publish where they looked and didn't find anything, right? Um, so, uh, so we can explain Pluto's orbit because uh, we know Pluto was captured, right? Um, we, we know that, you know, it, there was this big explosion of orbits changing and it got trapped into a mean motion resonance. That makes sense. Um, Eris, we can also explain orbits like that. It gets pretty close to Neptune. So we know in the past, it must have scattered off of Neptune. Uh, that explains that orbit, right? But Sedna, it's such a high paracenter orbit, like the closest it ever gets to Neptune is 46 AU away. That doesn't doesn't explain how it got there, right? We can't explain its orbit with Neptune. So how did it get there, right? How you don't usually have things forming on super eccentric orbits. So, uh, so why why is it there? Um, so okay, so we can add a little bit more information to this plot. So everything out here is uh, really big. Some of major axes is where you can explain the orbits due to galactic tides. Um, uh, that that will pull the orbits into different high semi high paracenter orbits um, down here. Even though they're still like 20 AU from Neptune at their their closest, that's enough. You can run run simulations and show that that little very weak scattering um, actually makes a difference to their orbit. So you can actually explain all of these orbits in here um, with Neptune's influence. But those two, <laughs> VP113 and Sedna, meh, we don't know. We can't explain them with what we know about the solar system currently. Um, so, okay, so going back to the, the Planet Nine theory, right? So these there's these six Kuiper Belt objects, right? And, and uh, the theory is that they're aligned by Planet Nine. So, well, where are those six objects, right? So they sort of make a cut at... Um, 
it depends on which paper you read, but they make a cut and say, okay, well, everything with, you know, some, some, uh, paracenter distance can't be affected by Neptune. Uh, but I don't know. I think, I think a lot of these you can explain by Neptune still. Um, and these one, this one out here, you can explain with the galactic tides very weakly. So, um, and so, so they're, they're sort of pulling the most extreme ones, but there's not like a good dividing line. Um, so, uh, and these are six objects from six different surveys where we don't know the the biases, right? So we don't know if anybody looked over here and didn't see anything, right? Um, so what about Osses, right? We had we looked at we found a lot of Kuiper Belt objects. Um, so four of the the TNOs that we discovered were very large semi-major axis and high paracenter. Are they aligned by planet nine? So okay, so let's look at this plot again, right? Um, so this is this is the plot that you see all over the place. I'm gonna this is from 2016. I'm gonna rotate it around um, so that it matches my plot. <clears throat> and uh, so this is uh, everything that had been discovered up to 2020. And I think there's only a couple of additions to this now. Um, so this is what this plot looks like now with high paracenter TNOs, right? So it's not as strongly clustered. Um, there, you could definitely argue that there's way more uh, objects with their orbits pointed in this direction than over here, right? So what are the observational biases here, <laughs> right? So, so Ossus, um, uh, these are the ones that Ossus discovered, right? So Ossus discovered two in the clustered direction, one in the complete opposite direction, and one pretty much 90 degrees off. So that is consistent with a circular distribution. Um, uh, the Dark Energy Survey is another large TNO survey where they kept very careful track of, of all of their biases. They really looked only in one direction, though. But even in that one direction, they still found they found three that were pointed barely in the cluster and then one more that's barely in the cluster. So, um, so OSIS and DES, so two, two surveys, this is you know, found that it is statistically consistent with a uniform distribution. Um, but you could argue, okay, well, there's only four. Okay, yeah, well, that, that's true. There's not very many. Um, so this is uh, sort of a meta-analysis that was done by uh, the DES team. They took all of the OSIS detections, all of the DES detections, and a whole bunch of detections from uh, Scott, Shepard, and Chad Trujillo's surveys. And uh, so the white is where uh, is orbits that um, would we would be sensitive to. So this is looking down on the solar system, right? And the red are the real things that were detected. And basically, you see, okay, we found stuff where we looked, right? So so there's nothing over here. Uh, there's there's actually a lot of weird biases that go into this, right? So uh, so in this direction like up here and down here, that's the Milky Way. It's really hard to find small fuzzy moving dots in front of the Milky Way, right? So we generally don't try to. Um, over here is like, I don't know, some some galaxy cluster or something. It's really hard to get time here because the cosmologists like to get time uh, in this direction. And over here is winter on Mauna Kea. So it's just harder to get time, right? So there's all these biases that are built into what we have discovered. Um, and then I just ran a very simple simulation, right? So this is the, the real clustering. Um, and then this is me saying, okay, so what if you just get observing time in Chile in the fall, just picking a time and a place, right? Um, so randomly, uh, so, so I'm drawing, um, uh, orbits all over the solar system and the only ones I can detect with that specific uh observing bias in time are ones that look clustered right so without knowing your survey biases there is no way to know if this clustering is real um okay but back to this right so these two very high paracenter TNOs we still can't explain right <laughs> why why are they there um, and so this is uh, looking at, oh, that, and I have it in French too, because I gave this talk uh, in, in French a while ago. Um, so uh, so paracenter distance versus semi-major axis. And now there's a whole bunch of extra points on here. So the purple ones are real TNOs. The green points are from a simulation that I did with Planet Nine. 
um, the uh, black points are a rogue planet simulation. So you add in an extra planet for a few hundred million years and then eject it from the solar system. What does that do, right? And so, um, so there's this this box here where these lower paracenter, lower semi-major axis orbits, right? So planet nine and a rogue planet fill up this part of orbital space, but we don't see anything there, right? Those should be easier to find than Sedna and BP-113, but we haven't found anything there. So why not? <laughs> this is some clue. This is telling us something important about how these objects were put on their orbits. Um, and there's a whole whack load of theories about it, um, but we, we don't know which one is is correct yet. We really need to find more stuff. So, um, so this is this is what we are trying to do now. So, um, so this is the classy survey. Um, so here's our our you know clustered TNOs. So what we wanted to do. Um, is basically do OSIS again, but deeper. So we're using the same telescope, but now instead of um, in, instead of just using single exposures, we're adding many, many exposures together. We can't just do longer exposures because these Kuiper Belt objects are moving, right? So by shifting the images at the rate that the Kuiper Belt objects are moving and adding them together, we can get much deeper. So um, so these are the directions that we're going to look, right? We're going to try to look in all different directions instead of um, just uh, just the directions that are easy. So um, so so this is just another view, right? So here's the galactic plane. Um, this is Osis, where Osis looked, right? And um, the the thing that I'm so red is our survey, right? So we have managed to get data every. Um, we have one year of data, so we've hit all of these positions once. Um, I'm really happy about this one. This is January, February. This is the hardest time to get data and we did it. <laughs> so I hope we can do it again next year because uh, that is the direction that we don't have any information. Nobody's really looked there for distant TNO. So this will be a really powerful constraint on whether this clustering is real or not. Um, and uh, also with any new survey, I expect that we're going to find a bunch of stuff that is totally weird and unexpected. So uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but are we going to actually uh, get our data or are we going to lose a lot of it? So now I'm going to switch talks here um, and go into the depressing part of this talk. So, um, so no matter where you point your telescope or where you're standing on Earth, there is a new source of uh, globally visible light pollution. I'm going to complain a lot about SpaceX because uh, Starlink has the most satellites currently, uh, but but a lot of other companies are are jumping into this, right? So there's currently, well, I, I hate updating this every time I give this talk, but there's now more than 5,000 Starlink satellites in orbit. Um, so I want to just point out scientific satellites are not the problem here, right? Uh, a lot of satellites, scientific satellites in orbit are like toaster sized or suitcase sized, right? Um, there are some kind of truck sized ones, but um, there aren't very many. There's a few dozen uh, for Earth observations. That's pretty much it. Uh, and HST, which there's only one of. Um, but uh, Starlink and OneWeb and Kuiper, so there's uh, these uh, for-profit communication satellites that are launching rapidly. Uh, they are the size of uh, of trucks, right? Like Ford F-150s. Um, that, and uh, they are planning for tens of thousands of them to be launched into orbit in the next few years. Um, and they're launching them in huge batches, right? So there's just, it's just the numbers don't even compare with uh, the scientific satellites that are already up there. Uh, and so all of the problems that I'm going to talk about uh, result from the size of the satellites and the sheer numbers of them, right? All of these problems would be greatly decreased with fewer total satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, the problem is also not in geosynchronous orbit. That is well regulated and it's much, much farther out. So the satellites are harder to see and harder to disrupt uh, science on the ground. Low Earth orbit is where this rapid commercialization is happening. Um, so, you know, astronomy is the science of looking at the sky and seeing patterns and making predictions based on those patterns. And suddenly the patterns that we're seeing are being dominated by humans 
Um, and, you know, th this is already, our, our access to the sky is already restricted by urban light pollution. Um, most people in the world cannot see the Milky Way uh, because of where they live being so bright. Uh, and a lot of this happened very quickly uh, due to LEDs, like it has gotten rapidly worse in the last few years because of LEDs and LEDs are great, right? Like uh, they are very energy efficient, um, but because they're cheap and energy efficient, they are super overused and the brightness of cities has increased uh, dramatically just in the last few years. Um, but you can get away from urban light pollution, right? There are dark sky preserves all over the U.S. and Canada um, and, you know, even just, you know, farmland outside the city, right? You can you can get away from it. You can still see the sky. Um, but satellites are everywhere. <laughs> why? Why is this suddenly a problem? Um, it, basically Starlink. <laughs> and so Starlink started launching satellites in, in 2019. Um, they have launched... Uh, 5,376 uh, in, in the last four years, they are now 57% of all active satellites at all altitudes. So they completely dominate low Earth orbit. Um, and that's that's terrifying, right? One private company owned by one kind of terrible person now effectively controls orbit. Uh, and they already have provisional permission to launch and operate 4,000, 40,000 satellites. Like it's, it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, so I complain a lot about Starlink, but there's a whole lot of other companies that are lined up to do the same thing. Uh, there was a paper that just came out a few days ago uh, where a, a group of astronomers did an analysis of the, um, the so, so in order to launch these satellites, these companies pretty much just have to get permission to broadcast to whatever countries they want to broadcast to. There's no regulation in orbit, just of the radio broadcast. So 1 million satellites are planned by different companies according to uh, the the radio frequency filings, which is t terrifying. That's that's a lot of satellites. Um, so, so the point of these satellites is to provide uh, internet access worldwide, right? Um, and it's, it's often framed as bringing internet to the whole world. We're such a great company, right? But if you look at um, how much they charge for their services uh, versus GDP, right? So can people in different countries actually afford this internet service? And then what countries have a low uh, fraction of people with access to the internet, right? So where this is needed is where you have a low fraction, where it's needed and affordable is where you have a low fraction of people with internet and where uh, where it's actually affordable, which is this corner of the plot with the legend in it. And there are no countries in that corner of the plot, right? And this is a huge oversimplification, of course, because, right, like rural US, rural Canada versus uh, urban Canada has very different internet access. Um, but uh, but the, the point is that this is not a charity, right? These companies are not charities. And like, oh, but but they gave internet to uh, Ukraine and uh, to Tonga, right? So. All, all of the the charity um, donations that I have seen from these companies have ended badly or just stopped. So um, just just keep that in mind. Like these companies, they do they talk big talk about we are bringing internet to everybody and this is great. And like yes, it's it's really important to have internet access, but at what expense? And um, and you're, they're not donating it to anybody. So so keep that in mind. Not charities. Um, so the reason that these satellites are such a problem for astronomy is because they're uh, they're bright. They reflect sunlight for a long time after the sun has set, um, and there's no rules about about it, right? We've we've gone through this transition where, uh, like, I used to you know, look up when the International Space Station was going to fly over and watch it, right? Like that was cool, and now. It makes me swear when I see the International Space Station fly over because I know what's coming. The sky has changed. Um, so how bright are they? Uh, so this is um, the delightfully archaic magnitude system that astronomers still use. So uh, basically anything that's a uh, lower number than six and a half is what you could see with your unaided eyes from a very dark place. So um, so four is like, you could see that from a light polluted suburb, no problem, right? So the first Starlinks that were launched were very bright for uh, for astronomy, right? And so 
uh, astronomers complained a lot uh, very quickly. And to their credit, SpaceX did actually try to respond to these complaints. Um, so they uh, they uh, actually did bring the the distribution much fainter, right? So now like half of them were um, were able to be naked eye visible because of of changes that they made to the satellites, right? Um, but the very the first one they tried basically just painting it black. That didn't work. It overheated and fried. Uh, then they tried adding visors, uh, and that interfered with some other aspect of the satellites and they took those off uh and the next generation of satellites um they ha they have a new coating on them the smaller ones that are up there currently have been measured to be fainter than the original starlinks but still brighter than the visors so and these next batch this next batch will be the size and and almost the mass of a ford f-150 uh so we don't know. We won't know until they get up there and we have to spend our telescope time measuring them. It's really annoying. <laughs> um, so they did, they did with technology, they did manage to make the satellites fainter, but they were still not faint enough. So Starlink uh, on a website that they have now taken down, they did claim that they were going to try to get down to seventh magnitude. So anything uh, below six and a half is not naked eye visible. Anything below seven is what you need to not damage or cause serious problems for um, very sensitive cameras in large telescopes, right? So this is this is a pretty big deal. Um, and then, so astronomers spend a lot of time talking to these companies, asking very, very nicely, please, please, please make your satellites fainter. And then a new company comes that launches a tennis court sized satellite. So this was just recently measured um, to be uh, as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, so, so sorry, the magnitude is flipped here, right? But um, so when it unfolded, it, uh, it, it gets up to magnitude zero. That's the brightest star, right? Um, so uh, they're, they're still launching more bright satellites. Oh, and this company reassured me that they only plan to launch 90 of these, so it's okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so these satellites, so what this looks like in long time exposure photos, which is what we need to see very faint objects, um, is many satellites will fly through your field of view. They're kind of following each other on a grid. So you get these grid patterns in, in your data, right? This horrifying, uh, image of, of a dark sky. You can, you can really see, right? And almost every single satellite that you can see now is, is a Starlink satellite. Um, so you can imagine this is much worse for uh, for research telescopes, right? This is one of the first ones that that came out. Um, I also hear the argument a lot. Why don't you just send all your telescopes into space? Well, this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's in the same orbit as Starlink satellites. So it also sees Starlink satellites, right? Um, the only telescope that's not going to have this problem is JWST, which is in an Earth trailing orbit. Uh, but that was a $10 billion telescope, and I don't see these companies stepping up to hand us $10 billion to build another one. Um, so this is my data trying to look for Kuiper Belt objects. So this is this is a raw image. Um, the So the streaks are just bleeding from bright stars, which are actually really, really faint stars. Um, and the diagonal lines are, are Starlink satellites that have flown through. <laughs> and uh, so the Kuiper Belt objects that I'm trying to find uh, right, so there's these little tiny thumbnails. So that's what I'm trying to find: these little teeny tiny things that are millions of times fainter than the typical satellites that fly through. Right, so I'm losing data because of these streaks, and it's only going to get worse. Um, so I don't know how many of you have gotten UFO calls from this, but like I get them all the time. People see so when Starlinks first launch, they're in a lower orbit. They're super bright and they're really close together. So it looks completely freaky and people think it's UFOs, right? Um, there was this New York Times article that came out that was like, oh my gosh, everybody's losing their minds from the pandemic. It's Everybody's seen UFOs and they didn't once mention Starlink, which started launching during the pandemic. So um, I, I'm really annoyed that Starlink is doing zero public education to tell people what this is. It's all left to us astronomers to answer UFO calls. So uh, it's 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 really obnoxious. I I was on uh, I had a radio interview in South Korea where they asked me about UFO sightings in India that were Starlink. Right, like this is worldwide. 
this is changing the night sky and they are doing nothing to educate people about it. Um, okay, so as a scientist, so I live on a farm, which is fantastic. It means I can see the, the Milky Way from my back door. Uh, I am so grateful for that, but that also means that I can see all the Starlink satellites that are changing the sky, right? So uh, so I really wanted to know how much is this going to change my sky? I was the kind of, it initially started as a kind of selfish thing. Um, and uh, so like a good scientist, I um, I wrote a paper to, to find out how bad is this going to be in my sky? So uh, Starlink, Amazon Kuiper, OneWeb, and uh, a Chinese company are planning to launch 65,000 satellites. Um, and so we ran a bunch of simulations. These are the orbits that these companies have asked for. This is just a snapshot of where these satellites will be over the world, right? You can see there are these, um, the, these uh, uh, caustics where there are higher densities just because of the orbits that have been chosen, right? So the orbits that these companies are choosing will affect the way that the sky looks for people on the ground. So we specifically wanted to know at higher latitudes, this was all, all Canadian authors, and we used a telescope in Canada to calibrate our simulations. Um, so we ended up, we used the, the Plaskett telescope in Victoria. Um, we observed uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of Starlink satellites that were visible at midnight uh, in the summer because they're visible all night long. And um, uh, so we were able to calibrate our, our model of, of reflection and see what is that gonna look like um, if all satellites are as bright as Starlinks, right? We don't actually know if that's an optimistic or a pessimistic assumption, um, but uh, this, is, this is what we started with. So 65,000 satellites, on their filed or predicted orbits. And then we used rebound to integrate the, the orbits forward. All of our code is publicly available. Um, there's a great simulation based on this that you can see how much your sky is gonna change. Um, so these are the simulations that, that we came up with. Um, so this is an all sky view here, right? So the different horizons, um, the dots are sunlit satellites. Uh, anything that's pink, orange, or yellow will be naked eye visible, um, and the, the total numbers are here. So this is on the winter solstice, the equinox, the summer solstice, uh, and this is nautical dusk, midnight, or nautical dawn, right? So this is Hawaii. Um, this is Canada, right? So in the summertime, we will have satellites visible all night long. Um, this is Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so here is your uh, your summer solstice sky uh, with 65,000 satellites. Um, so uh, so you can see that uh, as so the brightest satellites are right at your zenith. Um, as the night goes on, you'll get down to a few dozen visible satellites, but there will be naked eye visible satellites all night long from your latitude in the summertime. Even if you go to the North Pole, there's still satellites that are visible, right? You can't get away from these. So um, it's it's truly global whether or not you can afford to purchase Starlink internet access. Um, okay, so then I'm gonna quickly go through some of the other problems besides light pollution, right? So low Earth orbit is getting very crowded. Um, this is the number of bodies in orbit. So some of these are, are satellites, some are abandoned rocket bodies, some are just junk. You can see there's uh, an, uh, a couple of big jumps in the numbers here. Uh, there's an anti-satellite test uh, collision, another anti-satellite test. Um, this is like, this is where Starlink starts launching. Um, and uh, so this is showing altitude versus density, right? Guess where Starlink is? <laughs> so Starlink is, is at this incredibly, uh, the, the highest density of objects that has ever existed in orbit. Uh, it's it's kind of terrifying. Um, let me see if this will open. So this is a, um, this is not a simulation. This is real time data showing, uh, where, uh, satellite conjunctions. So close approaches between satellites. Um, and this, this is real, this is showing my time, but, um, so you can see over the next few minutes, uh, there will be several conjunctions within two kilometers, uh, a close approach, right? So that sounds like not very much, right? But remember that everything in orbit is traveling at several kilometers per second. So this is really fast. This is what's happening right now. This is real. <laughs> um, 
So that's already where we are, right? Uh, and we're coming up to solar maximum, right? Uh, satellites, especially Starlink, uh, rely on active collision avoidance. Um, what happens if they get shut down for uh, for a few hours and they can't change their orbits? Um, if there's one collision in that super dense orbit, uh, I think that that's it. We're we're in Kessler syndrome where you get this runaway collisional cascade. So. We just have to hope that Starlink is actually doing a really good job of, of collision avoidance, which they are so far, but they're increasing the densities very, very quickly. Um, and uh, they, they actually lost an entire batch of satellites in uh, last year due to a very minor solar storm, which makes me think they are not worried about this. Um, there's a lot of pollution happening from launch, right? The number of launches per year has just uh, skyrocketed, haha. <laughs> um, uh, the, so the emissions from these rocket launches is actually becoming quite significant, right? And a lot of these are, you know, like water vapor and carbon dioxide, which is not that big a deal for emissions. But when they're deposited in the stratosphere, uh, that really changes things. Um, there's also a huge amount of pollution that's going to uh, be happening as these satellites deorbit. Um, if you just run the numbers of what Starlink plans to do, they want to have 42,000 satellites. They only want the satellites to last for five years. So that's 23 satellites per day on average that they're going to deorbit. Each satellite is more than a ton, right? So this is many tons of material that's going to be added to the upper atmosphere every day, uh, mostly aluminum. We don't know what that that chemistry is going to do. Nobody's really studying this, right? Like this is this will vastly overwhelm the natural amount of of aluminum and other rarer metals um, that that are naturally added to the atmosphere by meteorites. Um, this this reentry pollution is now measurable. This just came out a few days ago, um, measuring uh, aerosols with uh, high altitude spacecraft. 10% um, of what they're finding is already from satellite and rocket reentry. And uh, the bigger pieces are going to hit the ground, right? This is already happening, right? Uh, different companies are dropping pieces uh, on different parts of the world. What happens if a rocket, if a SpaceX rocket crashes into somebody's house in, I don't know, Brazil? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> this is like totally untested. The only time this has been tested is when uh, in the late 70s, the Soviet Union exploded a nuclear a satellite across Canada um, and they offered to clean it up and the Canada said, no, thank you. We have giant American radar dishes. Please don't come here. Uh, and uh, eventually they paid Canada a piddly amount of money for cleanup. But um, this is all the only uh, treaties that we have in place are between countries, not between companies. It's not even clear if uh, if these treaties and uh, regulations apply to private companies. Um, one thing that would really help here is for low Earth orbit to be legally recognized as an environment, which uh, was tried to do last year or yeah, a year ago, and it it failed. So. Um, uh, but right now, it's not legally considered an environment. It's not subject to environmental regulation, even though it's intimately tied to our atmospheres and our oceans. So, uh, so that's that's scary. Um, so, so there's these great guidelines, right? Like if if we could just follow these, uh, any regulation that limits the number of satellites in orbit will make all of these uh, these problems less. Um, but I really think the most important one is still unpolluted access to the night sky is a human right and we should protect it. Um, so let's see, let me let me skip here. Uh, so the the most um, oh boy, the 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 thing that keeps me awake at night with this is um, the the DART mission, right? So we showed with the DART mission that we have the ability to uh, uh, to to sorry, my computer's crashing again. <laughs> Um, we have, there we go. We have the ability to, uh, to, to avoid a, uh, a collision with, uh, an, a satellite, I'm oh, sorry, a satellite, ah, a near earth asteroid, right? If, if a near earth asteroid is coming for us, we can deflect it. We have that technology now. Right. Um, but we need to find it in advance and the light pollution from these satellites is worst at dawn and dusk. That's when we need to be finding these near earth satellites. So near earth asteroids. So, um, so what can all of you do? Uh, we need regulation. The fastest 
but that's super slow. So the fastest thing is consumer pressure. So tell people what's happening. Most people have no idea. There's a great set of videos here on the um, IAU, so the International Astronomical Union uh, Center for the Protection of Dark and Quiet Skies from Satellite Meg Mega Constellations. It's a super long name. Uh, IAU CPS, you will find it. Um, you can, you, if you get UFO calls, tell your local journalists, right? Let's talk about why this is happening. Uh, talk to amateur astronomy clubs. They are super engaged and they are noticing what's happening in the sky. Um, tell, you know, those of you who do public observing nights, thank you. Keep doing it. It's so important to show people what they would be missing with, uh, with so many satellites in the sky. Um, you know, go go out, uh, volunteer, show kids. Skype a scientist is great, right? Anything that lets you show people the sky is fantastic. Um, if you have the option, don't buy internet from these these companies. Uh, if you do need to get internet from a satellite company, consider one that's at geosynchronous orbit. And uh, talk to politicians, right? We need regulation, especially those of you who are in the U.S. Talk to your politicians because a lot of this is coming from U.S. companies. Uh, we need regulation. Uh, and also we need better internet, right? Rural people in, in the U.S. and in Canada are way left behind with uh, uh, internet infrastructure. So that's why there's such a demand for Starlink. Um, and then there's there's a few groups that are that are fighting already for this. Uh, IAU CPS, like I mentioned, Dark Sky International. There is an American Astronomical Society uh, a committee called Compass that is also actively fighting this. And then there's lots of local uh, amateur astronomy groups that are that have been fighting light pollution for decades and and they are also getting on board with this. So so there's there's some ways to to help. Um sorry I went a little long. Um but uh, I hope we can have a little bit of a discussion about this and uh, thank you for listening. Great, great. Thank you. Sorry, Zoom, Zoom applause is a little bit underwhelming, but that was a great talk. And uh, yeah, I guess we can open it up for questions now. You can put them in the chat or you can just use reactions to raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, okay, go ahead, Kyle. Okay, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I... I, I thank you for like explaining there's like a lot of air pollution coming by satellite. I have known that. I mean, I was thinking that uh, the SpaceX was trying to like improve it by changing their paint to their satellite, but I didn't know there would be like more companies which should be like a, like a putting like bigger satellite which makes the air pollution. So, I mean, technically, I mean, nowadays, like, there would be, like, more companies trying to, like, send, like, satellite outside of the Earth. So I think there would be, like, I mean, this kind of problem would be getting bigger and bigger, not even, it, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go, like, uh, it, I mean, the, the situation would go, go go worse every time, as time goes by. I don't think it would be, get anything better. So is there any pl plan to, like, to, like, like overcome this kind of like a future problem or is there any way there can be like making making the air pollution coming by satellite to to overcome is there any like future plan for that um no there's not and and there's really no um so air pollution specifically there's there's almost nobody is studying this at all um there's no regulation on it um, it, it was only recently pointed out. So I think astronomers are noticing a lot of this because we're the first ones who are affected um, by the light pollution. And then, you know, just you end up going down this rabbit hole of like, oh, my gosh, there's these collision problems and this pollution problem. And ah, uh, but this isn't my science help. <laughs> so I, I hope that some atmospheric scientists will will start studying this also. Um, but like all of the all of the pieces of Starlink satellites and and other companies, it's all proprietary. They do not share at all what their satellites are made of. So we don't even know what they're adding to the atmosphere. Right? We can estimate it's probably mostly aluminum and some other metals, but we don't actually know. And that is not information that they share. So um, yeah, this is this is a real huge problem, and it will become a much bigger problem soon. And I hope that somebody starts regulating it. But right now, there's nothing. 
Oh yeah, then that, that's really, really a severe problem. I mean, if there's like a problem with in my common sense, there, I mean, people are trying to look for like solution and like future plans to solve this solution. But, but if when I when I like like hear hearing your presentation, it's just like in, it seems to be for me. It's like there is a problem, and this problem will be bigger. But nobody is caring about this problem, so there's no solution and. We are doomed. I think that's the conclusion. I guess. I, I don't think we're we're doomed, but uh, I think there will be some uh some problems coming up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So maybe we'll go to the next question from Stacy. Oh, this is in the in the chat. Um. So Hello. yeah. So. Oh, do you want to read no, it? Yeah, I, I had put a comment in the chat. I actually have a question. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. But but the comment that, that I put there, since you mentioned it, is this for us astronomers, yeah. magnitude six is incredibly bright. Exactly. Um, you know, if you build a 10 meter telescope, um, my graduate student and I were just working out exposure times for things that were 23rd, 24th magnitude. Um, that's over a factor of a million yep. fainter than um you know what what starlink things are making it as dark as they can make um yeah. so you know they can they can say oh we've made them darker but that's why you know okay now you're only pointing a thousand lasers in my eye instead of yeah. ten thousand you know it's yes it's, exactly it's very frustrating very frustrating uh, uh, so the question uh going back to the kuiper belt objects you mentioned that um, uh, the first ones found were all surprisingly, well, they're all near Paracenter. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's not surprising since they're brighter there, but it is surprising, as you say, that you would expect a lot more for every one that you find near Paracenter. There should be a lot more at APO. Um, so can you say anything about the statistics of that as you've discovered more is there a more reasonable distribution of peris or or can you infer what the population is um yeah so okay so so seeing most of them at paracenter is exactly what we expect from observational biases for this this population right that that's not surprising at all that's that's exactly what we expect um what's really cool is um with some of these really deep pencil beam surveys, like like uh, the one that I'm working on now, um, some of the initial results are hinting that we might actually be starting to see the pair, the uh, apocenter distribution also. Um, right, we're seeing like a clump of things at you know kind of the distances that we've been finding Kuiper Belt objects, and we're also starting to see things at. Um, larger distances, and we don't have enough yet to be able to say exactly what orbits they're on, or um, or if that distribution makes sense. But um, you know, running some very quick simulations, it looks like we're seeing a paracenter clump and an apocenter clump. So that that story all hangs together. Um, that that actually is is making sense. It's just we didn't have the sensitivity to to get that far yet. We're just getting there now. Okay, thank you. So it's not like. There's another sudden, right? This original sudden was surprising. And then it's not like there's yeah. another peri center clump. It's just the expected peri and apo clump that Yeah, you're yeah. Mostly okay. of of uh different resonances. It it all it all works oh, out. Cool. So right. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh Mike. Oh yeah. So yeah, thank you for that really interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the Nice model that you that you talked about uh um at, at the beginning. Um, maybe I missed this, but what caused the sudden shift in, in orbits? Yeah, so so it's actually, so um, so there's a lot of different versions, because the Nice model's chaotic, right? So there's a mm -hmm. lot of different versions that give you similar answers, um, but, you know, some only some teeny tiny fraction of them don't completely destroy the solar system, right? Um, but uh, that particular one that I showed... Uh, I believe that Jupiter and Saturn go through a two to one mean motion resonance with each other and they 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 excite each other's eccentricities very quickly and that causes this chain reaction of scattering events that um that moves the other planets out. So so that's one possible story, but there there are lots of other possibilities for doing similar things that it, again, it's chaotic. so it's really hard to uh, say exactly what it is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 
So, so I was going to suggest that, um, you know, we can, uh, uh, so Sam's kindly agreed to stick around for a, a more extended discussion. And I thought maybe we could turn off the formal proceedings, stop recording and so on. And then, um, you know, we can go, go over to that more informal phase. So let me start by turning off the recording. And then I would encourage people to stick around and you feel like you can turn on your videos and especially hope students will stick around because I feel like Sam has a lot of interesting uh, things to uh, to share with all of us. So yeah, stop recording. And 